This cut does not exist on that side. There is no windshield wiper movement or line on that. Yes. So, if I, will, if I were to believe that the windshield wiper is the Krupal, then how can I follow his instructions to hit him on his left side with this? <laughs> it doesn't work. So there are people out there who don't have this cut in their repertoire. Or they'll do it and I go, what was that? And they go, um, an undercut? I'm like, it's not an undercut. Okay. So here's where it gets confusing. Excellent. On that song, Yoko Meyer 1570 labels the lines. And he labels the two lower diagonal lines undercuts. Okay, because when you throw an undercut, that's the line they do go on. But he also leaves off of that target one of the other, he leaves off two of the five cuts. He never describes the squinting cut on there. He says vertical, diagonal, horizontal, undercut. Well, he's missing two cuts. So the, it's, it's incomplete. And he's just letting you know that the undercuts go on those lines. But this is also an undercut, and that's straight up the middle, and he doesn't list it. So if you try to just interpret that stiffly and, and, and not look at it holistically, then you're going to argue, no, no, the crooked cut's not on there, so it can't be along this line, which is asinine because that, that target is not centered here, and it's not centered here. It's centered anywhere. Yeah. It could be here, 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 here. It's just showing you the lines of attacks to the four quarters. So go to a, a left oaks, if you would. So, uh, oaks, oaks, so that was. So if he were there, and he does nothing, I can go, He's going to stop that. Well, then that's not a proper crook hat. Okay? But if I did this, and he does nothing, if he does nothing, then I think it is. If I sense the fooling, the resistance, and he tries to react, that's when I crook him. Or, oops, if he makes a thrust at me from that position, then I'll go here, and again, I'll crook him. Hitting him in the hands or stabbing him in the body, and his weapon is not hitting me. Yeah. Textbook, it looks exactly like the images when we're sparring. It looks like the images when we're doing demos, more so or less than today. And it fits the letter of the text. And there is no windshield wiper double motion magic bullet change of direction going on. There's no question that this cut comes down. It's not, and I've actually had people say, um, go to a long point. I've had people say, yes, but if you were to go like this, and then do this, at the last moment, when it hits here, it was actually coming up. It's like, oh, brother. The definition of an overcut is it's above, and it starts its action by coming down. The definition is not the spot it hits at the end. If we went by that definition, then, then going like this would be considered an overcut, <laughs> even though it was clearly a different stance. Uh, the basic thing to understand is every time you are in a different fighting stance, you are in the beginning of a blow. And every time you end a blow, you're in a different stance. It's Nijiani who says, um, between two guards lies a blow, and between two blows a guard. Wow. All right, so I could spend a whole hour on this. That's just the condensed version, because unfortunately, there's an infinite number of ways of doing techniques incorrectly, and only a few ways of doing it correctly. And this is so self-evident. It is so 
easy to see its tactical, technical, biomechanical application and utility. So when I see people that are doing this inane windshield wiper and, and they don't have this cut or they use this cut and can't identify it, and then they've magically created a cut that doesn't exist in the sources and doesn't exist on that sign, it's just, I give up, I give up. I, and, and then they'll do it against people that just stand still and allow them to do it. One last element. Um, when you look at the images, folks, they're awesome. You'll see that when they do the blow, the strong is against the strong when he's actually hitting them. Okay? The strong is against the strong portion. Maybe it's not the front. Again, he thrust. So strong is all. And the weapon's behind me. Okay? Ah, uh, there's no way, hold this. Back up a little bit. There's no way that I did this to an opponent. It can't happen. It can only occur through the exchange I just showed. And the images show the strong on the straw. It doesn't show anything else, but Talhofer shows the guys in us. And Talhofer shows him here in one plate, and then the next plate, he's in the long point, and Talhofer's probing him. And it's like, sweet. So, I'm done. I can cover a couple more things, but... Um, I mean, uh, I, John, I, uh, I need to say something. I mean... I'm really, and I'm not, I mean, many of our team members, not only team members, people who watch our channel, I would like to thank you in the name, I mean, all of them said it, you explained so professionally and so well. And uh, as a martial artist, I would like to thank you for these excellent, you know, really very good and excellent explanations. Very professional, John. Thank you very much. I cannot uh, say enough how much I appreciate that you are sharing your knowledge of years of experience here on our channel with all of us. Thank you very much. Um, John, could you, I know maybe he's asked so much because I don't want to change the weapon and I would like, if you have time, I know you are busy, we can invite you back and back to this channel. Could you share us, but let us stick to long sword. Let us not change the subject of long sword, this excellent weapon. Could you just share one more technique with a uh, long sword with us before we just call it a day today? Yeah, sure. Uh, thoughts? Uh, the two different kinds of splinters. Where well, I kind of already did that. Yeah, you did do the, the short ones. Too. Okay. Um, one of the other misunderstandings is parrying. And I have a whole wall here of quotes from the masters where they say, don't parry. A good fencer doesn't parry. Parrying is almost always detrimental. You don't block, you don't parry. Now, later arts and other arts around the world, they will do rigid parries, okay? So, a verbal. They'll do this, they'll do this, they'll do this, they'll do this, they'll do this. Etc. We don't. It's not in our sources. In fact, the Master Meyer says, quote, do not parry in the common fashion, which is to say, to hold your weapon out and to allow it to be struck upon, such is not the art, and, and it's suicide. Um, the Master Fabry says, the, I think it's Fabry. Or is it uh, says the, the parry is a form of fear. And if you weren't compelled to parry out of fear of getting hit, then you wouldn't see the need for it. And because of this, you can compel the opponent to parry and create an opening by the action. Master Meyer says, I will provoke my opponent with the blow that he then tries to ward, and I take away what he's warded, and then I hit him. So I provoke, I take, and I hit. And sometimes I do it in, in one or two actions rather than three. Lichtenauer says, uh, uh, 
that no man defends himself except in fear. And if you understand this, he can't hit you. Why? Because the guy's too busy trying to block and he can't hit you. So you attack, 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 you retain the initiative. So the word parry or perere originally means to set aside, to ward off, to cover. And you're supposed to do it, as Degrassi explains, when the weapon comes around, it moves in a circle. And the weapon has more force at the end of the circumference than it does at the center. So you want to close in and ward by moving toward. You know the English word toward, to move close to? Break it down, it's to, it's, the word is to ward. So to ward his blows, you close in, you move toward him, toward him. Wow. Um, so there's all these statements about uh, you bring your parry with you when you strike, you bring the parry with you. And that as you have learned to strike, you have simultaneously learned to parry because you're counter striking. So they want counter strikes. Here's the best example. Meyer says, he throws an overcut at you. And when he does, you're gonna go to the hanging point guard. And then you're gonna hit him. And he says, though this looks like two movements, know that it is one movement with two parts. So it could look like this. So for me. So all I did was this, a round strike, but if you break it down frame by frame, I went here, okay. and I warded him close to his hilt with the strong of mine, and I did it as Meyer specifically tells us. You will dis displace him, verset, mit der flat, with the flat. Oh, okay, I want to ask you this. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, switch. <laughs> right? What? Back of the sword, wicked fast, could be the long edge. I could slip. I could do a triangle step. I could have again. I could have stayed and went with my cross and then hit or done this or this or this. Again, cut. I could have done that. Hit, hit. Wow. Again, again. Uh, I could have come in here like this and done this. And on and on and on. Another 25 techniques. And Meyer says, you do this in one action. How about this? Cut. Sit. I let it slip. And I did the same move. So all I did was wind it up. Wind it up. So Meyer says, and this is where he says, don't parry in the common fashion by holding your weapon out and letting it be struck upon. He also says that this can be done half sword. And in his Dusak section, he says to do it with the Dusak and then stab him in the face or cut him in the ear. And then he says, the hanging guard, I believe it's Meyer, who says the hanging guard can be used against all the overcuts. And then later on, we're told how the hanging guard is just a variant of this. So, and again, on the flat of my blade, my sword is designed, swords are designed to take the impacts here on the flat and be resilient. The hard edge they're designed to cut with. If I block with the edge, I produce micro fractures that will cause it to fail. It will crack, it will break. They're, they're, it would never occur to them to deliberately hold an edge out 
and block with it. Oh, but they do that in 18th and 19th century swordplay, which is inferior, retrograde, using clumsy swords, and they're not facing this pantheon of diverse arms and armor in vicious all-in combat. They're just doing sabers and cutlasses and broadswords based upon their stick play. This is far more dynamic. So if this can be used against all the overcuts, and it's a variant of this, you'll also see that I can use it over here. Okay, we are back here. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So there's one element, one aspect that can do, and that is when the sources tell us to counter strike with a particular edge and to cut at his sword with an edge. And what they mean is not that cut. I'm not supposed to go bam and then hit him. No, no, no. Nor am I supposed to catch it, and, and Master Meyer says, don't catch the guy's blade. Yes, sometimes it happens, sometimes it, it, it's a necessity, but it shouldn't be doctrine. And the Master Achille, uh, Camillo Agrippa says, I advise no friend of mine to parry blows. Parrying is almost always detrimental, but I admit that sometimes it is a necessity. Whoa! You know, you have to. 
but not do it out of doctrine. Okay, so if he cuts at me, and we'll just do a vertical cut. Why? Because it's the hardest one people have trouble with. Cut. All right, so I'm counter cutting him. Right? But for a split second, our weapons clash here. And I imposed, I, I impeded his blade. I covered and I impeded, and then I broke his cut. And his cut is harmlessly going there, or sometimes he'll be here, and then I'll do that. But, don't but remember, I didn't parry it because his cut is up here. My cut is here. This isn't his cut. Return. Cut. So he starts, I go in, I bind on his weapon, and then I counter cut. So our edges, these portions, which are moving the slowest, have the least amount of, of force and impact behind them, but the most resistance and leverage, that's where I'm impeding him, binding him, winding my point around, and cut, cutting him with my long edge. Although one of those was a short edge. So they'll, they'll see that and they'll go, but, but didn't you, don't you block his edge with your edge? Like, there was no blocking at all. I, like I said, I have a whole wall of quotes where they say there is no offense except for defense, that offense is defense, and on and on and on. And if you examine this art, you'll see that proper defense is done in a single tempo, and on and on and on. But so, so, we, so they don't do the later kind of edge block, resistant, rigid blocking. They counter strike and they set aside. And they parry by warding it off, by moving in and binding and winding. And we are told that the closing to bind and wind is the true and right art. Wow. I mean, Very different from what you see in other types of arts where they rely on that. And, and this method will outfight that method. And this applies to single swords as well as double hand swords in this art. Mm -hmm. um, John, it is very interesting that you are saying this because I know that in uh, European martial arts circles it has been a discussion flat parry or edge parry. I can tell only something from, as you know, from two things I would like to share with you. First, Asian martial arts, be it Persian swordsmanship, be it Chinese and Japanese, because I come from Chinese and Japanese then to Persian. None of them say edge parry. All of them say flat parry. Oh, and I can say it, Japanese, Chinese, and Persian. So when I came and uh, into contact with European uh, experts and colleagues, they some of them ash parry. And they asked me, why don't you ash parry? I said, in uh, Japanese, Chinese, and Persian, they all say, they told us not to ash parry. And they told me this is Asian art. I said, Okay, but I can I don't know European art. So I can just say again, Japanese, Chinese, and Persian, no edge parry. And that for sure I can say, right? So then then um, yeah. you see that these three sources, I mean, these are three big civilizations. Let's say Persian, Japanese, and Chinese, right? And so, and then it came, I know you're showing this also that flat parry with the Europeans. So I just wanted to share this with you that it what you are showing us is also in Persian sources, also in Japanese, also in Chinese, right? So I know it is flat parry. This is the first thing. The second thing, which I really, really loved you said, is so interesting for me, because I have my PhD in English, English linguistics and word formation, toward and toward. And <laughs> this is the way you explain it. as a linguist in English language. I really love it, toward and toward. It was beautiful, That's right? Important. I you know, a small whiteboard over there. Yeah, it's, it was a very yeah. nice uh, word formation. You mentioned that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's I, very interesting. I think yeah. there are, there's two phenomena going on with the edge parry debate. One, um, I have talked to people who are practitioners of. Oh. So you like the English, the two word bit, okay? You know. Yeah. Okay. So, to, to ward, is it mirrored or is it proper? 
Uh, yeah, it is okay. It is okay. Yeah. I can see. To ward is to ward. Okay. Right. Right. All right. Well, offense and defense. Yeah. Yeah. So offense is to act of fence, and defense is to remove the opponent's capacity to fence. Yes. So, <laughs> offense is una defensa. Offense is defense. Yes. Beautiful. Capo Thank Ferro, you. 16, um, <laughs> I, I noted that, and I contacted the Oxford English Dictionary back in the 1990s, and I said, your entry for the phrase offense is defense gives an 18th century source, and that's incorrect. It appears in Capo Ferro's fencing text 15, 1610. And they went, thank you. Do you have a source? I gave them the source. And they said, okay, we're going to footnote you as being the source for that entry. <laughs> and then I later find it in like the 1520s, uh, uh, either Altoni or Manchurino says almost the same thing. Okay. So about the edge parry thing, there's two phenomena going on in my opinion. One is 20th century stage combat. Theatrical fencing, stunt fighting. They deliberately teach the edge parry, deliberately. And all around the world, we see people doing fight demos and stunt routines and choreographs, things where they'll do the edge. They're wrong, right? Second, I have talked to reliable sources in Chinese, Japanese, and Indian martial arts who have assured me, absolutely, edge pairing is crazy, you damage your sword and you're, you're catching the guy's blade wrong, we don't block. And then other people will argue with me from those same sources and they'll go, yes you do. And I, and I say, well, why don't you argue with this other person from your own art? saying no and it seems that all the people who are saying do edge parry are westerners studying those arts but the natives of those arts japanese indians and chinese who i've talked to they go no you wouldn't do that but the westerners doing a modified 20th century version of it either they've been taught wrong or they got it wrong and, you know and i've documented this in books and, and videos you know, John, maybe this is interesting for you. This goes back to the 10th century in Iran, Persia, in Book of Kings, and you can find it in many other sources. Shamshir ar in Persian means turning sword into a saw. So they say, do not defense with your edge unless you want your sword to become a saw. And you can see it in you have, some... you, have, you must send that to me. You must send me that. I must no, have a quote. It is in my, I will send you it to you. You must send it to me. I need the whole thing. Yeah, give, me, give me the citation. Give it to me in the original <laughs> Persian, Farsi. Yes. Give it to me in English. I, oh, I love that. Because you know, it is in, in my, century, you know, it is in my lexicon. I wrote a lexicon on arms and armor from Iran. It is there. And in my Persian archery and swordsmanship. But I will give you these and also the original sources. Okay. Shamshir Arre Arre Shodan. Me, they okay. repeatedly say, don't make your sword into a saw, right? You know, the going back to the 10th century. 10th century already. 10th century. Can you imagine? The 12th century. Uh, I think it's the 12th century. There is a, um, uh, a Spanish knight from, I think, the 12th century, 13th. And he's, he's wounded from the Crusades. And he's laying in a boat in the harbor and he can't go back to his wife because he's wounded. He needs to rest. And he says, take my sword and send it to her for the blade is of no use to me for his, the edge has been struck so many times that it cannot be sharpened. Yeah. And then in the, I believe it's the ninth century in the tale of Skagi, this, this Norse saga, I think it's Skagi. Um, Skeggy borrows this guy's sword to fight a duel, a home ganga. And he wins the duel, but on one of the blows, he blocks it with the edge and it gets really gouged. And he's like, oh no. And they're like, what's wrong? You won the duel. And he says, well, 
it's not my sword. I borrowed it. And the guy's going to be really pissed at me when he sees how badly I got, I gouged it. <laughs> then I have a letter of reprimand to a 19th century British sea captain and his ship goes under inspection and they go to the armory and they give him a, a fa failing grade on his armory, citing that all of the cutlasses had their edges chewed up because his crew were fencing improperly with them and hitting them edge to edge. Okay, so we get all those examples and we have 19th century and even 18th century examples where people will say, hey, when you parry, you only do it with the strong lower portion of the blade. But later, later 19th century people don't make that distinction. And they show illustrations of people just, put your button up. They'll show people doing this, using the weak against, well, this portion, which we call the weak because it's weak in resistance, but it's strong in the force when it hits. Strong in the force. <laughs> um, so below, they're, they're showing illustrations like this and like this. And none of that exists in our sources. And I've even seen people, there's a half, okay, we're gonna back up. Mm -hmm. All right, um, give me a good vertical cut. Cut. Bomb. Or again, cut. So when the blow comes at me, I'm doing this, or I'm doing this, okay? I am not doing this, and I'm certainly not doing this, and if you do that, oh my God, you're going to get hurt in your hand. And I've had people argue that, look, there's an edge parry, and I'm going, that's not an edge parry, you're, you're deluding yourself, it's just what I showed. So I think a lot of practitioners, they're just so used to doing this and they don't care if their weapon gets chewed up because it's a blunt sword. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I've got a number of blades where over the years we've taken sharp blades and we've struck them as hard as we can and they're ruined, ruined. And people go, well, then, then, then swords were perishable. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, so they made a sword to last one fight? No, I don't ever think about using my edge to parry. I don't think about using my flat to parry. I don't teach parry. I just comment when a student does this, I'll go, don't do that. And I'll show them biomechanically that they're better off doing the things that I've shown and it organically, holistically keeps their edge aligned to strike and it keeps their flat align aligned to guard with. It, it, it doesn't, there's, there's no going out of the way to deliberately use your edge, which is why the sources don't warn us, don't parry with your edge. They don't have to. Only imbeciles would parry with their edge. But it's the 19th century guys that are certainly saying, block with your edge. Okay. So, 